A shadowy mask turns my way, lips set into a neutral line. Jesus. <laughs> On your knees. Anything for you, Beyonce? Hello and welcome back to my channel. I am Sleepybug and today we are going to be playing Obscura Chapter 1 The Descent. So just so you know this game is um, for the older crowd for 18 plus so if that is not you then maybe this video isn't for you. We have other games on here that aren't necessarily 18 plus. Go ahead and check those out. Love you! We have our support animal. We have our... Today we're featuring our peach frog. Yes, I'm stalling. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> I'm nervous! What's your safe word? Why do I need a safer? Why, why, why do I need a safe word? The X key will also take you directly to the safe word menu during gameplay. Leaving the safe word menu will take you back to the game. The safe word button is hidden by default, but can always be seen by mousing over the top right corner of the window. Okay. It can be made always visible in the preferences when menu. Please enjoy Obscura. Hey. I know. No one goes into the mountain without a reason. Purpose of business. Oh, buying. No one takes their past into the mountain. How are you gonna pay? Some funds and some work. Good luck with that. Everyone knows what it means when you go. No one says anything about it. Give me your bags. The guard looks through my things with perfect efficiency. Bored, they start asking me questions. What are you going to be called down there? Um, Miss? Here we go. One, two, three, four, five. Sleepy. Good choice. You have a mask, Miss Sleepy. No one would sell me one. Not a problem here. If you're buying, we're selling. The gate guard waves to the mask hanging around the entrance, perhaps once worn by other visitors. The masks are an old custom, plausible deniability. 
We're all faceless strangers under the mountain. Pick your poison. Okay. Stop making me choose things. Uh, the charcoal colored one with worn lace and gold trim. Okay, I like I like lace and I like gold. Gold complements my skin very well. The cream colored one with flowery details painted across the left side. That sounds cute though. The burgundy colored one with swirling embossed patterns. I think I'm gonna go with the flowery one. I don't know if this snaggers or if they just want to give me a choice. I take a mask off the wall and fit it to my face. It weighs on my head, but my mind feels lighter. I see my reflection in the mirror. The people under the mountain have beautiful taste. I hand the gate guard the money owed. Welcome to the marketplace. They step aside, allowing me passage into the tunnel in the other side of the mountain. I begin. My descent. Whee! At first, I have to wonder if I had been tricked in some way. The passage grows narrow, the air stale, and the path uneven. I am walking by the last feeble threads of light that reach this deep. But then I see something. A shimmering pale blue glow from around a corner. I fight through the narrowing walls until I am able to turn the corner. The passage suddenly widens, then it opens. I step from the passage into a cavern so massive I can hardly see the end of it. The marketplace. There are several masked people who are seated or leaning against the walls around the little entryway. And now they are approaching me. Oh, welcome, newcomer! A fresh face. Someone could use a guide, couldn't they? Hucksters are perhaps petty thieves looking for an easy mag. My valuables are kept under my heavy robe, safe from pit pockets. I steer myself and march forward past the strangers. There is no logic to this place. A fishmonger selling dried or salted fish next to a bookseller with stacks of forbidden tomes. A fungus man and bird keeper are bickering. If they weren't obvious scams, I could have taken one of the offers for a guide and saved myself some time. At first, I glance at each stall in turn. Out here, nearest the entry tunnel, all of the stars are selling simple amenities or cheap thrills. The sorts of things a departing traveler might want to have when they ascend. Not what I'm looking for. <sighs> it's not here. Well, I suppose it wouldn't be. Asking one of the sellers, I get directions. The rough walls of this cavern, shifting and trembling in unsteady candle and glowworm light, slowly turn smooth where natural walls turn to human carved. The ramshackle turns to ramshackle buildings to paint it in varnished walls. The quality of goods on sale is improving as well. The cheap basics are behind me. Ahead are the rare, the luxurious, and the illicit. The illicit. The real reason anyone comes here. Seeing the sign for an apothecary, an easily recognizable serpent coiling around the staff, I slip inside. Welcome! The shopkeeper is masked, of course, but that is not what grabs my attention. The din of hundreds of voices selling and buying and negotiating in the echoing caves is muffled, but not by much. That is because, while the apothecary has four walls, there isn't a roof over the store. Newcomer, huh? What? You must be a fresh arrival. And why would you say that? You're staring where the ceiling should be. Ah. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh. Well, 
I suppose in a city with no sun or rain, roofs are unnecessary. Only thing a roof keeps out in the marketplace is thieves. A common weather pattern here? Far too common. <laughs> I make an effort to examine the apothecary's mask. It's plain. Plainer even than mine. Perhaps he is frugal. Or perhaps he is poor by the standards of the marketplace. Well, you weren't driven here by the weather. What do you need? I'm looking for Lunar Ecor. I resist the urge to explain my circumstances to the shopkeeper. No matter how meaningless or petty they seem, my secrets are one of the few resources I have in these depths. You have expensive tastes, or terrible luck. What I don't have is a lunar ecor. Is that something you can remedy, apothecary? No. That was quick. No. <laughs> if money is a concern, I can make arrangements. It's not the money. I could never afford to stock that darnable ecor. Even if I could, I doubt I would be able to stomach it. The rumors were true then. That is unfortunate. Where does one go then to find the darnable ecor? Smuggler dens, the vaults of the lords of the market, or perhaps you could take a knife to the lunar god. Failing that, the auction house may provide. It's the largest house this side of the ruby walls. It even has a roof. <laughs> the apothecary cannot see my smile, but I hope he can hear it. I thank you for your timely advice, sir. Save your thanks for the Lunar God. It'll be a miracle if you get that ecor. I take my leave of the shop. The noise rises again from the loud to deafening. There are tunnels and additional caverns of all directions, but I continue the way I was going. If the walls are getting smoother and the buildings are more beautiful than I am approaching the richest part of the market, it stands to reason that this is where the auction house will be. Keeping my eyes up, it takes no time to find the auction house. It is as the apothecary said, the largest house this side of the ruby walls. There are long chains of glowworms draped over the promised ridged roof that dangle and sway as the air shifts in the cavern. The building itself is deep, garnet red, with gilded trim. Message received. You're very wealthy, whoever built this. <laughs> the doors, covered in tiny engravings, impossible to interpret in the dim lights, are wide open. Bright golden lamplight pours out into the street. People are freely milling in and out, and so I slip inside. I am underdressed for the occasion, but neither of the guards standing in the door move to stop me. The sound of the outside suddenly dims and I have to blink against the sudden brightness. I can hear my own muffled footsteps as I cross the plush carpet deeper into the auction house. The whispered conversations through masks make a thin fog of sound compared to the din outside. The signs are in a language I do not recognize, but I can make some educated guesses. The ornate double door standing locked and guarded must lead to the actual auction house. Oh. There is a short uncarpeted hall with gleaming polished floors lined with several doors. After a second, I see a giggling pair exit one of the rooms and straighten their clothes. That explains that then. <laughs> There is one door that is a little more than a window on hinges left open. I peer inside for a second, only to see an ordinary office. Come in. The stranger sitting behind the desk waves to me, and so I step inside. Pardon me, I didn't mean to intrude. You can't intrude on the bookkeeper. I must always be available. You must? B? How else could anyone check to ensure I am not meddling in the books? Does it really come to, to that? 
Oh, well, I have no such concerns. A buyer, are you? Couldn't I simply be a browser? <laughs> you really believe someone would come to the marketplace, to the auction house, just looking to see what they find. I suppose someone must have in all of history. Well, if that's the scale you're measuring by. You, however, are not here to browse. N no, I am not. You're right. I am here to buy. Shall I show you the catalog for the next auction? I, I would appreciate it. The bookkeeper stands and hands me a sizable booklet. Do not damage it. Do not leave here with it. They open a drawer to their desk and hold up a knife. It's a little thing, but I have no doubt they could kill me with it. Okay. It's wild. <laughs> then they sit again and resume their work. I flip through the book. There are objects of unimaginable value. Works of art by artists even I know by name. An exquisite jeweled tiara fit for a princess. The deed to a country manor on the surface. Then there are wonders I couldn't have dreamed of. The bird weathered in flames that never burns. The still beating bloodstone heart of some rock nymph. A potion of clear vision. I flip a page and am met with a miserable exposed face of a young adult. Their posture is low and defeated, but they are beautiful. The text informs me that whatever is paid in the auction will be sent to their family within the mountain. Surely not. <laughs> I flip the page again. There was no other people in the catalog, but one is enough to turn my stomach. Uh, thank you, bookkeeper. Finished already. What I want isn't in there. And what is it that you want? I'll check the history. See when it was last sold. I bite my tongue for a moment. Lunar Ecor. An unlucky one, aren't you? <laughs> I couldn't say. If you would, bookkeeper. <laughs> they shuffle through a book. I try to read the text, but it is nearly impossible to interpret their faint pencil scratchings. More bad luck to heap on your pile, I'm afraid. The last sale was three months back. It's unlikely we'll get another sale for months yet, unless someone new comes with a stock. It couldn't be easy, could it? It's okay, girl. It's okay. And what was the final price for it? For a lot of 12. The number they tell me is stomach dropping. I could not gather those funds in a lifetime. Even divided 12 ways, the price for a single vial is well beyond my means. My life savings weigh heavily in the coin purse under my robe. Dead weight, it seems. By your silence, I guess you don't have the money. Thank you for your time. I try to keep my voice neutral. When I leave the auction house, I momentarily lose my sight and hearing as I just against the dim, echoing cavern. I don't notice the direction my feet are taking me. My hopes for a quick visit to the marketplace have been thoroughly dashed. Now I have to determine what to do. I think better after some rest. I can't, I can't give up, believe it. <laughs> Let's do everything that true sleepy bug would do. I'm taking a nap when I'm stressed. At the moment, I don't trust myself to make a sensible choice. Staying on guard here in the marketplace is exhausting and my feet ache from climbing the mountain. I need some kind of rest before I have the energy to determine what to do next. I need some rest before I have the energy to determine what to do next. I stop by a stall and ask for directions for a decent inn, rest place, 
public house, anything. Following the directions through a short tunnel, I wander through a quieter district in the marketplace. Though quiet is relative. The guest house is a challenge to find. Though I hesitate to call the ground down walking path roads, there are rest house lining them on either side. The leaping bear, the guest house recommended to me, is nothing remarkable. The building has a roof, but the building itself is mostly made of raw wood. The brass doorknob is smooth under my hand, polished by thousands of guests who come and go. Inside, the atmosphere is boisterous, but on the scale of a handful of people singing a drinking song. The chaos outside is already muffled and distant. Welcome! The woman who approaches me has her face fully covered in a bear mask, but her neckline is untied and exposed. I wonder who she works for. <clears throat> Hello. I was told that this is a good establishment to stay the night. You were told right. Except the part about night. Here, there's no difference between night and day. Plenty of folks are up all hours of the day, as you do. Just sleeping when they're tired and forgetting the sun ever existed. I see. The bare max woman has me sign into a guest book and pay for the night. You have the room for 24 hours. If you're staying longer, I expect you here to pay for more time. If you don't, you might find all your things at a moonshrine. I'll remember. Thank you. And you'll be needing these. She hands me a doll metal medallion with on a leather string and a key. Dear Rufus over there. She gestures to a mountain of a man, also in a bear mask, standing by the door. Make sure only guests go to their rooms. The medallion proves you're a guest. Don't lose it. Or else I'll find my things at a moon shrine? Pick up things quickly, you do. Seems like an important skill to have here. <laughs> Quite right. <laughs> She gets back to her business, so I approach the mountain of a man guarding the door to the rooms. Uh, hello, Rufus. I hold up the medallion and wait. I'm not about to rush a man with a bat, especially one as bloodstained as his is. Then he nods and I am granted passage. He watches me as I go to my assigned room. I suppose it's a good measure to prevent theft, but then so is the bloodstained bat. Thanks. Sleep doesn't come easily at first. How can I risk sleeping in the marketplace? But it does come for me. In the morning, or what my body decides is morning, my resolve has hardened. Leaving the marketplace without Lunar Ikor would render everything I've done pointless. I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I stopped trying. I am able to order something like breakfast from the Leaping Bar's kitchen and then sit deep in thought staring into a bowl of porridge. Eating with a mask is a bit of a bother. I have to navigate the spoon around the mask. There's a clasp, you know. I start at the sudden appearance of the proprietress. What? Feel along the side of the mask. There should be pins or clasp holding the bottom part. I do as she said and find little clasp holding the two parts of the mask together. Well, I feel like a proper fool. <laughs> it hardly feels strange having my mouth exposed like a funny kind of nudity. Newcomers are all a bit foolish. That's part of their charm. Thank you, I think. Just keep your wits about you. You'll live. You make it sound so dire. <laughs> well, you're here, aren't you? <laughs> you're not wrong. <laughs> no one comes here without a good reason, I should think. What's yours? A personal matter. Buying or selling. That's all there is down here, after all. Buying. Something I might not be able to afford, it turns out. 
That won't narrow things down much for her. Well, depends how you're trying to buy things, doesn't it? Money will get you anywhere if you have enough of it. But there are other worlds out there. Is that something you'd know a lot about? I couldn't say. I only know what the stories the guests bring in. She says it flippantly enough that there must be a story there, but I resist the urge to dig. Then I suppose my next job is to find what paths I can use. Thank you. Oh, not a problem. The mask troubles everyone at first. Just ask for Bruna if you have any problems. I'll be happy to help. She sweeps away to handle another matter, and I'm left with far more productive thoughts. Money can't get me Lunar Eclor, but something else might. Influence, friendship, violence, guile. My body if it comes down to it. Anything. There's a lot to think about. Am I going to stay in a guest house for weeks or months? What possible ways are there to get Lunar Eclor? Let's start with one foot in front of the other. Over the next several days, I get to learn the layout of the marketplace. It's an ever-shifting rat's nest of stalls and passages and unmanaged pathways, but there are some fixed landmarks. I can navigate somewhat comfortably by those landmarks when they are visible. One evening, based on my eternal clock, the proprietress of the Leaping Bear hints over a mill that as long as I am well-behaved, she would be willing to extend more generous long-term rates to me. I wasn't planning to misbehave, even less so with Rufus keeping an eye on me, and so that settles the matter of lodging for the moment. As for the Lunar Ecor, I am at a loss. It is rare, absurdly rare, and based on the reactions of those I keep about, some aspects of it is very taboo, likely the condition it treats. I'm wandering one of the quieter passages, clearly natural by how uneven the ground is. It's mostly homes built on whatever smooth patch of stone the builder could find. But there is one that towers over the rest, a tall church with heavy oaken doors, where normally I would expect to see a golden ten-point solar sigil. Instead, there is a more simplistic crescent-shaped one. The Lunar Sigil. Ah, I suppose the Solar God isn't much help down here. I have seen the airy blue-green light of glowworms and the smoky gold lanterns, but I have not seen the sun since I started my descent. Churches dedicated to the Lunar God exist outside the mountain, but not in any significant numbers. The Lunar God Lunar Ecor. It can't hurt to ask, could it? I'm not sure I believe that the Lunar God must bleed for there to be Lunar Ecor, but there's no harm in checking. Hey, stop! I halt in my path inst instinctively, although after a moment I can see no one was speaking to me. Instead, there is a raucous crowd gathering just down the tunnel, shouting and tussling. A few people in utilitarian masks and what looks like uniform trying to push their way through. It looks like trouble. Oh, no choices! Run to the safety in church, stay and see what happens next, or leave. Maybe God will save me. I'm a heathen, but let's do it. In my haste to escape the ruckus outside, I scramble towards the entrance. Then once I ascertain that they aren't locked, I slip through the imposing, massive oak doors. The carvings in the wood press into my palms, a surprisingly comforting grounding sensation. Then, once the doors close, the change in atmosphere hits me. This game has no... This has no... 
business being this pretty. <laughs> like, it's just a very, like, a very sweet, like, not sweet, like, haunting. It's, like, haunting a little bit. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. First is the smell. Candle smoke, heavy incense, and cold, crumbling stone. Then comes the solemn silence. The kind that reminds you of your place within these holy walls and the oppressively tall ceiling. I'm finally alone. Even just for a little while. I take that moment to release the breath I was holding and take in my surroundings. This is where the inhabitants of the underground come to worship the lunar god. It's also a reminder a reminder that I still haven't found any adequate leads for the Ikor. When I take a couple of steps down the carpeted paths between the aisles, I suddenly make a figure out at behind the altar. They were wearing long robes. A priest, maybe? Excuse me. I call out, taking care to not to raise my voice too loud. The person shuffles around, and I see their mask, too. Although this comes to no surprise, it's an unfortunate realization. Even those in the service of the Lunar God aren't safe from the marketplace. He scares me, because... I feel like he's gonna, he's just gonna add, he's just gonna add to, to you guys knowing my type. <laughs> oh, I'm nervous. Okay. Y'all see, I had to move closer. I had to get serious. As they approach, I notice the distinct glimmer of a gold brooch nestled between the folds of their clothes, proof of their holy devotion. Their entire appearance is refined and almost ethereal. Hmm. A rich, silken voice. It takes me off guard. Same girl. Do my ears deceive me? Or has another fight broken out? The priest stops a few meters from me, and from here, I notice that their mask doesn't cover their mouth, which is set in a thin, disapproving line. Y you're right, it's quite the scene outside. I pause. I was hoping I could lay low here for a while. I'm not one for brawls. Ah. My star. The church will always be a place of safety for those who need it. Please stay as long as you like. He gives me that vibe, y'all. He gives me the... My sweet, come and stay with me. Okay. I was taught that all lunar priests call their believers their stars, but it makes me smile. Me too. <laughs> me and me and MC Sleepy are here. We're here. He looks terrible. He looks like a menace. He looks like a menace. But he's really cute. He's a cute penis. Well, thank you, Father. A twitch of their lips. Cirrus, you need not call me by those stuffy titles. A man's name, I had a feeling. I doubt it's his real one, as it's the case with most people in the marketplace. But even a fake name speaks volumes about someone's personality. Would you like to light a candle while you're here? Huh. Sure, why not? I follow him toward the back of the church past the initial altar and stop in front of the statue. It towers over us, surrounded by a row after row of marine blue candles and the sight takes my breath away. A sea of light. I don't believe I've seen you around these parts before. 
small talk. I light a match and watch the flame flicker slowly as I bring it to the wick. The only rational thing to do is to answer with vague pleasantries to make sure I don't devolve important information. I am far from being well-traveled. I think I might see the appeal now, though. Is that so? Despite not being able to see his eyes through his mask, I feel them on me. Cyrus makes no effort to follow up on his last comment, and the two of us fall into silence. You're a bit of an unusual priest, aren't you? His lips twitch again, forming into a polite smile. Would you care to elaborate? I like to keep my secrets. Hmm. We're standing closer now, shoulders only slightly apart, as we watch the new flame sway in unison with the rest. There's such a strange comfort to it all. I could linger here for hours, soaking up the atmosphere. I'm curious about what it's like. Being a priest, I mean. Are we flirting? Are we are we flirting with the priest? He's a priest. Are we flirting with the priest? Cause I mean I get it. Like I get it. I'm mad about it. Demanding answers of me while not offering up your own? Behind my mask, I suppress a smile at his light probing. Can't argue with that. <laughs> well. I love him. Okay. He's terrible, but I love him. Well, I understand your caution. The marketplace is by no means a safe environment. But, if it is any comfort, my star. I am bound to the lunar scriptures. It is my job to ensure the visitors here feel safe and cared for. The words roll off his tongue with practiced ease. I like the way he calls me his star. I do not trust him in the slightest. I do not trust him. I don't trust him. He... He, he don't feel right. He don't feel right. He don't feel right. We know. We know. We know. He don't feel right. But I do like the way he calls me his star. I know that's what you call everyone, but... Being called a star does make one feel a little special. My answer makes him pause for a bit. You are special. Everyone is special in their own way. If everyone is special, then that kind of defeats the purpose of the sentiment, doesn't it? I'm mouthing off for the sake of it at this point. <laughs> Funneling the day's frustrations into banter. <laughs> Flirty banter. But Sirius doesn't mind. I feel his eyes on me again, with increased intensity. What if he actually does mind? <laughs> he gives unrelenting Dom vibes. Like he, like he, uh... Like he... He likes you to listen to his, his rules and his orders, and I would gladly do it. Would you rather I say you a bit more special than everybody else? His voice is laced with unexpected warmth, teasing me like an old friend would. Why yes, that sounds a lot better. I think I ought to be heading back soon. Errands run themselves. Good luck with that, my star. What can I call you the next time we meet? Next time, huh? Um, Sleepy. Sirius repeats it, testing the pronunciation. Then a smile spreads across his lips. It suits you. Thanks! I picked it myself, because I'm always tired. See? <laughs> 
he he doesn't like it. Well, he likes it, but he doesn't like it. Okay. Quite the mouthy one, aren't you? It's part of my endless charm. Hmm. That it is. There is so much sexual tension, I don't know what to do. We bid each other a polite farewell, and before I know it, I'm alone in the streets again. I trudge through the market stall, sweeping over any new available content, as I have every single day since coming down here. Murky colored crystals, vials filled with shimmering liquids, rare animal leathers, but nothing even remotely resembling the ichor catches my eye. The serenity that filled me at the church is instantly squashed. Instead, all I feel is dread. I've already been over this. What? Serious? Know anything? Mm. It's worth asking, and it's the perfect excuse to head to the church tomorrow. Until then, I keep walking, because that's all I can do to keep myself busy. At night, I toss and turn. Not even the end's freshly clean sheets do anything to soothe my restlessness. <sighs> Before I know it, it's the next day, and I've barely gotten a wink of sleep because we were too busy thinking about the hot priest who we had immense sexual tension talking to. Bruno stops by for the usual breakfast chatter, but my mind is elsewhere. All I want is answers. Eventually, I'm back at the doors of the Lunar Church. Something about them beckons me. A deep magnetism that draws me straight through the entrance without a second thought. There's a different incense wafting around me. It tickles my nose with notes of mahogany and velvet. I expect to see Sirius in the same spot as yesterday, but find him further in this time, with an unmasked woman kneeling before him. Since I don't know what's about to happen, I just think this is a fantastic opportunity to let you guys know that I do, I do have a Patreon. For 18 plus games with all the 18 plus scenes. So, <laughs> just it's in the description, just in case I might have to cut a lot of this game because it. I don't like the way he looking at me. It takes me a moment to understand what's happening. What's happening? The priest doesn't say a word. His stature is imposing and almost regal, practically towering over the other person. Completely different from yesterday. I can't really make out what he's saying, but she doesn't move, and eventually his hand finds its way to the top of her head. Perhaps he's blessing her? I wonder why the atmosphere is so heavy in here. I decide to hang back, it's not my place to in interrupt whatever ritual may be going on. My eyes roll over to the decor instead, specifically specifically the paintings and the detailed scenes they depict. Massive oils on canvas, crackling with age at the edges. The larger one shows the two gods at opposing ends, dancing around the earth in harmony. Their arms reached out for one another as their endless rotations continue on until the collapse of the universe itself, unable to ever reunite. Mm. It's a little sad. Sleepy? I didn't notice him approach me. Sirius's tone is warm and comforting, and the smile right under his mask peeks out as usual. It's as though the ceremony from earlier never even happened. Hey, I'm... I'm back. Didn't want to disturb you back there. Back there. Oh. 
Oh. He tilts his head, lips stretching into a mysterious smile. A menace. This man is a menace. Did I make you curious by any chance? No. Ab about the ceremony? Yes. Mm. Yeah. You both seem so serious. Don't think I ever seen anything like it. Hmm. There's a pleased rumble coming from his chest. She was readying herself for something important in her life and needed some reassurance. So she turned to the lunar god itself and demanded she be fully cleansed. Why? Simply so that she may begin that chapter with a clear conscience. More than that, I cannot say. Privacy and such. <laughs> oh, um, that's fine. Thanks for explaining. Either way, I'm sure you didn't come here to spy on me and the paintings. His comment makes me smile. He's... <laughs> Maybe I did. Hmm. If I could see his eyebrows, the tone of his voice suggests they'd be raised right now. Hmm? I guess you're right, though. I'm in need of advice. A pause. My star. Nothing pleases me more than knowing you feel comfortable enough to come here for help. Sirius comes closer and for the first time I take notice of his height compared to mine, a giant. He's got at least a full head taller, I called it. <laughs> what can I do for you? I hesitate, unsure if he really should be trusted or not. I'm looking for something. Lunar Ikor, to be specific. Something in his demeanor shifts when he hears this. You're sure? Quite sure. That's quite the task. What do you need such a precious resource for? I find that I don't really appreciate him sticking his nose where it doesn't belong. Oh? Oh, I see. Fractum anima. I thought that illness had very well vanished from this world. His words startle me as I instantly stare up at his face, hoping to catch a glimpse of his eyes through the holeless mask. The only better way to ensure he's telling the truth, if he actually knows what he's talking about. But I see nothing, of course. Only the intricate embossing of the metal surface. He knows the name of my illness. Wasn't expecting that. How do you... I've encountered it before. Though it remains exceedingly rare. As is the cure, of course. I assume you've axed around and seen for yourself. The weight of the situation returns to me, as my chest feels as if it's being crushed. I know that. I feel him placing his hands on my head to give me a gentle pat, a compassionate gesture. We want head pats. We like head pats. Then, the same hand trails down to cut my cheek over the mask's surface. The sudden intimacy of the gesture makes me jolt. Stop it! <laughs> My star. What if I told you that there might be another way? I feel my hand twitch, then curl into a fist. Impossible. I wouldn't be so sure. The Lunar God is a benevolent, wondrous being. 
Goosebumps erupt all over my skin and my heart leaps into my throat. It's too good to be true. It has to be. There is no conceivable way he could have the answers right here, on the silver platter. Everything about this situation is making the alarm bells go off in my head. Instead of cutting Cirrus off, I wait for him to elaborate. Cirrus's other hand captures my other cheek, so my head is cradled in his embrace as his voice drops an octave. Y'all know I can't do that. It's okay. Jesus. <laughs> You're shivering. I'm scared. Time around us seems to come to a standstill. I don't have the cure. Not yet. But I want to help you. I see how brightly you shine and how much you want to overcome this. I could never turn a blind eye to that kind of hunger for life. Will you let me help you, sleepy? Yes. Yes! I can't accept it. Heck yes! <laughs> yes! God. Of course I... How can I thank you enough? I need nothing. I am simply performing my duty, and knowing that it may save someone makes it all more rewarding. I'm still in disbelief. My mind is overcome with a sudden wave of confusion. I need to know the details. But he's been so kind to me. I have a hard time doubting the validity of his claims. Sirius adjusts his gloves in a practice movement. I'll need a bit of time. Getting a hold of this substance is not an easy feat. The disappointment in his tone is obvious, and I believe him. Even for someone with more influence, there's bound to be obstacles in the way. How will you get a hold of it, then? Have you heard of the Lunar God's healing prowess, my star? He turns to face the giant statue surrounding the candles and motions for me to follow. I have. And how much do you know about it? As we both come to a halt, my head tilts up to get a full view of the statue and its surroundings. I respond with silence. Hmm. He is too entertained by me. Like, it's like a little cat. Long ago, it was said that the priest were able to receive a sample of the blood that flows in these higher beings' veins to save their people. That is the ichor that we know of today. Pure, concentrated life force infused with their powers. In this case, healing powers. But there is no reliable way to get a hold of it these days. I hold my breath. That being said, this blood had once been taken and thoroughly analyzed by a man who then went into hiding. Rumor goes that he left all these notes behind after passing away. Suddenly, his explanation starts to make sense. You're saying we could find these notes and replicate the composition of real Lunar Igor? Precisely. Don't trust him. Never trust a man that fine. Don't do it. My mind goes into overdrive. How could this be f the first time I've heard of it? I have to rein myself in before I get carried away. Sounds pretty illegal to me. Where do you know th all this from? Cyrus smiles wide. This man went by the name of Nexus, and he was a fellow priest from this very church. I hope you know just how difficult you're making it for me to believe you. <laughs> 
It's just not possible. Please rein in your expectations, sleepy. As he uses my name, the timbre of his voice turns serious for once. I did not know him well. Few people did. He was a reserved person with not much to his name. Finding his residence, or wherever he may have hidden his secrets, is bound to be a difficult task, and I'll need all the help I can get. And once we find these notes, we'll be able to replicate it with the information we have, nor that someone will do it. The knot returns to my throat, but I have more to cling on to than when I first arrived. <sighs> well, better try than do nothing at all. Indeed. Something grabs a hold of me. Determination, unlike any I felt before. Hope soothing my heart. Even if it's just for a little bit, I can't quite let my guard down fully. But this is a first step. Eventually, we fall into silence as we stare up at the statue. Just checking, but... It's not as easy as just saying pretty please and then having the equator be here before us. He chuckles. Unlikely. But if you'd like to offer a prayer, that will always be encouraged. I contemplate the idea. Uh, sure, why not? I think I'd like to. It can't hurt. But I'm not sure how to. I don't know any lunar prayers. Allow me to guide you, my star. That's suspicious. That's weird. I nod. His shadowy mask turns my way, lips set into a neutral line. Jesus. <laughs> On your knees. Anything for you, Beyonce? <laughs> the usual warmth of his voice is completely stripped from his command, and I very quickly realized that this must be the mindset he was in earlier when he helped cleanse the other woman. For now, I obey. Shoulders straight, hands together. The words are efficient and utterly nonsense. It's easy to tell he's done this a million times. Chin up, sleepy. Do not hide your face from the lunar god. Expose your emotions. I feel vulnerable, protected, annoyed, pleasure. Ah, uh, I won't say annoyed. Let's go. I feel. Yeah, I could feel. I could. I could see why this could feel protect. Like you, you feel protected. Surprisingly safe. <laughs> it's a comforting feeling knowing that someone is guiding me like this. Though I never felt as though the lunar god was one I believed in. I feel myself opening up to this being, allowing them to see me for who I really am. For a moment, I feel at peace again. You're almost there. Simply repeat after me, my star. I don't know if he put his hands together as well. I don't dare look back. But he begins a short prayer, speaking solemnly and clearly. I repeat the words after him, again and again. We fall into a trance, and with that, I hope that my pleas reach the moon. Finally, it's over. I take a moment to regain my awareness of my surroundings and raise my head. Are we praying? Because it, it feels like a little... a little... 
Okay. You did very good. I'm certain your prayers will be heard. He smiles patiently as I rise from my kneeling position and stretch out. I hope so. <laughs> Try to believe in yourself a little more. No such pleas could fall on deaf ears. I've, I've got my doubts about that. But still, I appreciate your guidance. I'm about to ask if this is how the prayers usually go when the echo of doors creaking resonates through the church. New visitors begin filtering in, and the spell is broken. My inner clock tells me it's time to head back. Thank you for today. I'll come back tomorrow so we can start researching. By all means do. I'll do my utmost to find any leads and let you know if there's anything to work with. We share a quiet smile. Get home safe, sleepy. Or should I say, sleepy. I wouldn't want him calling my name. I would melt. I leave the church and step outside, right back into the darkness. Aw. Because it's like usually when you step outside, it's into the light. Like, you're like, eh. On my way back to the Leaping Bear, I stop at a food stall for some hearty potato soup and allow myself to take a bit of time to relax. I don't think I'll ever truly get used to not seeing the sun, but I'm starting to warm up to the underground as a whole. Halfway through another sip, I think back on what happened at the church. I don't understand why he was so insistent. It was kind of nice. I hated every second. I kind of liked it. It was kind of nice. I didn't mind it. Like, he's shady. Don't get me wrong. He is very shady. But I... It was It was just... It was just praying. Sirius may have been pushy, but I can't deny it. The session felt wonderful in the strangest of ways. Obeying felt natural in that moment. And just maybe... Maybe I wouldn't want it to happen again. Either way, I need to come to terms with what happened. I have to work hard while I'm here. After loitering around for just a bit longer, I pay for my soup and begin my long detour back. Passing through the marketplace so many times means I have started becoming a familiar face, and in turn, I recognize some of the owners. Still looking? Unfortunately, yes. I'll keep my eyes peeled for ya. The owner of the bookstall nods in my direction, and I know without a doubt, he will. Like many others setting up shop here, he can be a treasure trove of rumors and information. Say, could I ask you something? Depends what it is. Have you heard of a priest going by the name of Nexus? The shopkeeper falls silent in thought. The shopkeeper falls silent in thought and drums his finger on the surface of the wooden display table. Can't say I have. Why? I heard he passed. I kept my intentions vague, and if he notices, he doesn't press it. Not exactly an uncur Not exactly an uncommon occurrence around these parts. Thanks anyway. Today's search is unsuccessful yet again, but I don't let it bother me. After all, I have Sirius's lead. Just as I'm about to turn back towards the end, I narrowly dodge bumping square into someone's chest. Fancy looking stranger. Oh! Uh, I bow my head in apology, but the stranger fumbles back distraught. Oh, oh no, oh dear, I hope I didn't startle you. All good here, are you okay? Please don't worry about me, I should apologize instead. I'm not sure how to feel about the sudden outburst. When I take in their appearance, I instantly know it's one of the noble sons from the surface. His skin sports a rich, 
sun-kissed glow that almost makes me envious. The high quality of the suit's fabric and the elaborate pieces of jewelry don't lie, either. They're selected with obvious care and attention to the outfit as well. Even the mask is perfectly coordinated with the rest of his suit. He does look very pretty. Like, I enjoy his mask. It's cute. It looks like a little fan. Or like a sun. Like a mountain. And that's not necessary. I'm fine. Look. I hold up my hands to show no harm was done. Oh. Oh, I sure am glad. Oh, he's cute. I hope- or they're cute. I hope we'll meet again, if you don't mind me saying. You are a very kind person. The person takes my hand and brings their lips to it. An old-fashioned custom at this point. I'm surprised to see somebody still doing such a thing. Um, thank, thank you? There really is no need for this, um, but thank you. Um, my pleasure. At first glance, he's an easily frightened short. I'm not sure how much of that is genuine. P please take care, and allow me to make this up to you someday. The person quickly excuses themselves, and I'm left baffled. The underground truly is a strange place. It's a testament to how many different people congregate down here. But you never really know who you're talking to, after all. I shake the thoughts from my head and finally find my way back to my room, where my bed welcomes me after a strange day out. It's funny how familiar this inn room has become, too. Even seeing Rufus's face and his bloodied weapon every day has become something of a comfort. I'm sure that eventually the church will feel the same. That same church is empty the next day I step inside. There's nothing but the echoes of my own calls of Sirius and the flicker of the candles around the statue. For a while, I simply wait in front of the altar. Five minutes turn into ten, which turn into twenty. At this point, I'm pacing around the candles, wondering where he is. Didn't he say he might have some information today? Curiosity and boredom take me into the back of the church, where I've seen ornate doorways lead to who knows where. Maybe they're his chambers? That's when I hear it. The muffled shouts. The left door is slightly ajar. And as I peek past it, as discreetly as I can muster, I finally catch a glimpse of Cirrus. And he's not alone. Mm. There's a strange tension in the air, one far more prominent than yesterday, and it dawns upon me. As I lean forward against the wall, that he's genuinely angry. Oh, I kind of like his li his little lip sneer. He said, "Like yes, yeah, like I mean, disgust, daddy." Stop it! Get some help. The usually smooth, silken tone of his voice is raised towards the person in front of him. I don't know who it is. But they have their hands raised defensively, and their own words come out in much difficulty. Do better, I promise, please, just give me time. That is not good enough. The venomous hiss makes me jump. I never expected to hear this kind of anger coming from a priest of all people, on holy grounds no less. I can't speed up the process, not anymore. They'll be on to me. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Show me that you're sorry. A shiver runs down my spine. What is happening right now? Sirius expectantly hands the person in front of him something that gleams in the candlelight, pale and deathly. It's a blade. 
My blood immediately turns tense at the sight, and my heart beats skyrockets. I have to do something. Is it even safe to interfere? Crap! Wait, what do I do? Uh, confront, and the person leaves. Um, um, um. Interfere, confront, see yourself, the person leaves, walk away, confront. Confront! <laughs> oh, wait. I clicked the wrong one. Can't move. I'm too paralyzed by the sight in front of me. How could this be happening? The person now wielding the knife holds it to their hands as they would a precious jewel, then looked up at Sirius. Their voice trembles. Right here. Hmm? No, you're right. In front of the statue would be a more fitting setting for this. Crap! <laughs> Shall we? Yes, yes, by all means. In my panic, I try to shuffle back noisily. In my panic, I try to shuffle back noisily, but one of my steps nearly fumbles, allowing the clacking sound of an echo freely between the walls. Who's there? Is it too late to run? Would they find... Just as I'm about to make a run for it, a hand clutches the fabric of my robe. Hard. I've never seen that person before. No matter how much I struggle, there is no time. In just a few seconds, I'm face to face with Sirius himself. If I didn't know better, I'd say he's stunned to see me. He nods once in the other person's direction, who proceeds to drag me through the doorway. Sleepy. Sirius's voice turns back to the warm, comforting one I've always heard. But right now, I don't know if I trust it. You shouldn't be here, my star. I'm simply taking care of some sensitive matters. You have to understand. Sensitive matters? Really? You... You gave him a knife. One that he was going to use on himself. On himself? He pauses. I think think you have the wrong idea. What I gave him was not a weapon, but a ritual dagger. One used in the elaborate dances and rituals of repentance. I'm left utterly speechless. I stare at Sirius, then back at the trembling person. When I ask them if it's true, they nod. Mm, I, I think I should leave. I think you're staying right where you are. Whatever you say. When I gaze back up at the priest, he's smiling in a way that gives me chills. Leave for now. We will continue this later. He dismisses the shivering person without so much as a glance in their direction. They immediately obey and shuffle off. Then... The door shuts behind us, and when I ask why Sirius is locking it, he gives me no answer. He tucks the key away in a pocket. And with that, there's no way out. I had to put my comfy blanket on. My, my, uh, my safety blanket. When I refuse to look up at him, his fingers grasp my chin with surprising strength and force me to meet his masked gaze. Do you make it a habit of snooping around and eavesdropping like this? Usually I don't have to, but then I heard shouting. You poor thing. Don't you patronize me, sir. Maybe a little, but like not all the way. His smile twists cruelly. I did keep you waiting for quite a while. Did you miss me? Never. 
I'm not sure what's making my heart race faster now. The adrenaline or the fact that he was so close. No matter. I'm going to teach you some manners. Listening in on important conversations is very, very naughty. He steps even closer, completely suffocating me with his presence. Have you ever been punished before, my star? Wait. Punishment? Why do I have to get a punishment? You are over here handing people ritual daggers. And yelling. I've done nothing wrong. Nothing. I don't want your punishment. Take it back. I don't want it. Yes. I'll think of something adequate for a little eavesdropper like you. Of course. Since it is your first infraction, I'll go easy on you. But penitence is of the utmost importance down here. And I think you the best keep that soul of yours unblemished. So he kind of cares about me? Like, that's why he's doing it? Okay. I mean... If that's the case. I feel something inside me shiver at the thought. His words sound like the most delicious promise. Are we okay? What? Well, I guess not. One that I'm all too happy to help with fulfill. Yes. Yes, I'm... Hush, little star. As much as I enjoy the sound of your voice, you really do talk too much. I, I'm sorry. He takes a step back, finally allowing me a bit of personal space. Then he immediately turns around and makes his way to one of the minimalist wooden shelves in the corner of his room. There's barely anything in there, save for the sleeping arrangements and some storage. His shelves, on the other hand, are crammed full of jewelry, books, and small, neatly labeled vials. It's the vials he's aiming for. As a long digit reaches out to brush over one of their corks. Mm. I'm wary of his every move. Me too, girl. <laughs> and when Sirius is back in front of me, two of the mysterious vials in hand, I tense up. I'm aware the situation may have you a little on edge, but I need you to trust that this is for your own good. His expression falls, and in that moment, I wish I could see his eyes. What would I find if I looked deep within? But the more I think about it, the less I understand. Please. For the first time, I hear him beg me, and it's a completely alien feeling. What... what you got there? Serious? I try my hardest to keep my voice neutral as I ask. Serious pops one of the vials open with nimble fingers, releasing a sudden wave of strong, honey-like aroma, cloyingly sweet almost coating the back of my throat from the smell alone. I think we're staring at each other now. The intensity of it makes my hair stand on end. Raise your mask and open your mouth. Do it! Do it! <laughs> I hardly understand myself right now. I may as well have asked one of the thieves to watch over my purse. But something tells me Sirius doesn't want to kill me. No, if he did, he would have done so earlier. His intentions, although I fail to understand them, are not evil. So I undo the clasp of my mask, then tilt my head back, lips parted. Mm. Perfect. So very perfect. Such an obedient little thing. 
He approaches, and the first trickle of liquid hits my tongue. The nectar is just as thick as the initial smell, but now that it runs over my taste buds, I'm overwhelmed by the flowery, syrupy aftertaste. I feel it sticking to my lips like a glaze, and when he continues pouring, it trickles down my chin. It doesn't taste bad, but... It... Something feels off. As the liquid settles in my stomach, I feel strangely aw aware. Aware of everything. The way my nails scrape over the skin of my palm. The way my chest expands with every breath. The fragrance of the incense and how it clouds my mind. I promise you, it's just temporary. He speaks in a soothing, measured way. What's temporary? Sirius's hand rests on my shoulder, and while I feel every single digit through the cloth, the sensation of him traveling those fingers down the length of my arm should just elicit a small shiver. Instead, it feels like a sharp, cold wave that borders on actual pain, taking me entirely off guard. My breath catches in my throat, and even that feels like an overload of sensation, like claws digging around my lungs. This. There's affection lingering under the cruel curve of his lips, and it takes everything in my power not to make any sudden moves. Now. The sooner you complete your task, the better. You'll see. It's not too difficult, and the Lunar God will also be very pleased with you. He's taking his time, walking in slow circles around me, observing me. You're going to do so wonderfully, my star. I notice amidst my panic, that the second vial in his hand contains uncooked rice. He won't. But why? His thumb pries the cork off the top, and with the tilt of his wrist, he empties the contents of the vial, showering the wooden floors in tiny pale grains. Do I have to clean it up too? <laughs> I hate that I feel afraid to ask what it's for. You should. Knees. He asked me to get on my knees a lot. <laughs> knees. He whispers, and I know it's not an order I can defy. But the moment my knees reach the floor, the rice digs into my skin, and I instantly understand. My legs feel like they're on fire. The individual grains push further into my knees, and with a muffled curse, I try to adjust my position. What the? What the heck is this? Just as I shift to look up, the sight of Sirius holding an actual leather flogger makes me release a strangled sound I didn't know I was capable of making. No, no, no. Easy there, easy. You're going to do it yourself, so it won't be so bad. After all, you're the one who must repent. Mm, beneath that mask, I am sobbing. I take a deep, careful breath. What if I refuse? Sirius chuckles, and it's devoid of its warmth. Oh. Then I suppose I'll have to take matters into my own hands. Hmm. Can't have my little star ruining her chances. Do it yourself? I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. You do it. I don't want to. Oh. Guess we wasn't on the same wavelength this time because I was I didn't know we were going in this route. <laughs> what if I want 
you to do it. My own voice surprises me, and I feel my face heat up under the mask. Hmm. His expression is utterly indecipherable until a strange grin tugs his lips. Sweet little star. His voice thickens. Oh my god. I didn't take you for a masochist. You never asked. Oh, we are on it too. Oh my god. <laughs> I'll be sure to reward that honesty plenty. He handles the flogger with an experienced grip, and it doesn't take a genius to see he's done this plenty before. All I can do is stare at the tail swaying around and prepare myself for the impact. We'll start with ten. I close my eyes, but no amount of deep breaths or mental preparation ready me for the impact between my shoulder blades. My vision goes white as mind-shattering pain explodes all over my back. It's unlike anything I've felt before, and it takes everything in me not to scream. The next hit comes sooner than expected, just a few centimeters lower, enough to revive the previous state surge of pain. Alongside that, the rice continues to dig further into my knees. This time, I scream. Perfect. Suffering for your wrongdoings and completely letting go. What a wonderful sight. Another two hits of the flogger make me choke back sobs. I'm so proud of you. He murmurs a few words in a language I don't understand under his breath, giving me a moment to curl up and brace myself for the next hit. But Sirius isn't having it. Sit up, sleepy. When I refuse to budge, still trembling with the aftershocks of pain, his fingers hook into the collar of my cloak and tug. They pull up further and further, but before long, I'm gasping for air and clawing at his hands. <laughs> Sirius? I said... Sit. Up. My struggling only serves to please him further. At this point, I'm desperate for all of it to stop. I nod and fight through the sensation until he releases my cloak, after which I fall back to my previous position on my knees. Everything aches. Deeply. There's six more to go. Oh my god, there's six! We only got through four! I can make it through. Just need a bit longer. But the next hit comes far too soon. I'm screaming again, the force of it resonating in my vocal cords. Each individual tail flick leaves trails of fire searing across my back. As the flogger traces a figure eight across my skin, my throat tightens up. Please, God. I feel warm tears dripping down my face. Mm. He takes a deep, satisfied breath. That's it. Beg for forgiveness. By the time I receive the final hit, my vision goes blurry, and I realize my senses are dulling again. A pleasant numbness washes over me. Darkness quickly engulfs my senses. I'm not conscious long enough to realize that my body has already collapsed onto the floor. The safe word is looking pretty good right now. <laughs> Can I tell him the safe word? Can I be like peaches and he'll stop? 
By the time I come to, I'm surrounded by the smell of cotton and the feel of something warm and soft on my arm. It's just the right lukewarm temperature, something like a damp cloth gently dabbing away the sweat and grime of my skin. I keep my eyes closed, fearing it might stop if I happen to open my eyes. The cloth is removed, and I hear the sound of water dripping. Where the sensation returns to my other arm, I almost exhale in relief. It feels so comforting that I'm tempted to drift off again. It's when the cloth runs up the side of my neck that my breath hitches. Are you awake, little star? Darn. <laughs> I decide not to respond. Hmm? His thumb crawls up to rest over the edge of my ear, and with a deliberately slow ghostly touch, he runs it around the shell until it reaches the lobe and gives it a pinch that makes something inside me tingle. Your body is betraying you. Open your eyes, sleepy. He is over me. <laughs> okay, so just as much as he's a menace, we're also kind of a menace, and I kind of like it. Talk about playing dirty. I shift on the mattress underneath me. Do all priests make it a habit to fondle their visitors during their sleep? Mouthy from the moment you wake, I see. I bite back a response and take a moment to reassess my situation. The effects of the syrup have long since worn off, though I'm felt with a little sensitivity sparking up here and there. Do you want water? His sudden kindness surprises me this time and I nod in response. I hadn't realized how parched I really am. Wait here. Sirius quickly makes his way out of the room, leaving me all alone and disoriented. Mm. I need time to organize my thoughts. About that punishment, for example. After all, I now know for certain what kind of person Sirius is. I need to do... With this to get the ecor, the structure of the ritual was comforting. It was very enjoyable. It was it was kind it was kind of comforting. I felt pain, of course, but the whole process was comforting. He was the one taking care of all the decisions. I didn't need to worry about any of that. I can just focus on what I need to do, and let him work out the complicated details. And for now, I think that's okay. I just wish I understood why he cares so much. I lower my hood while he's gone, allowing myself having just a little freedom to move. I'm tempted to remove my mask, but it doesn't feel like the right time. I can't show Sirius more of my face. My head is still swimming as more questions continue to pop up one after another. I doubt that all the followers of the Lunar God engage in these kinds of behavior. Unless the underground is a fair bit kinkier than I anticipated. Actually, not very surprising. That still begs the question of why Sirius is having me undergo this. Personal satisfaction? A genuine desire to follow some obscure commandments? Questionable morals? Before I can come to any kind of conclusion, he's back with a tray carrying a pitcher of fresh water and what looks like chocolate? Correct. He hands me the little tray and I expect I inspect the contents. This better not be spiked again. It won't be unless you give me a reason to, little star. I'm not sure if he's joking or not. Reassuring. I take a swig of water, letting it soothe the back of my throat, before I reach for the square of chocolate. It's dark, with an uneven surface. When I take a bite into it, I'm surprised by the hint of lavender and black tea that melts in my mouth. Little grains are spread throughout the chocolate, and with each bite, they release a burst of flavor. Volunteers sometimes come help with food. 
And on the good days, there's leftovers. Could get used to this. We sit in silence for a while until I set the platter aside and shuffle into the better position against the headboard. How is your back feeling? It's okay. Hmm. I'm having a hard time gauging his reaction. Then his lips tug into another, calmer smile. It is my duty to make sure you're all right. That being said, I have a question for you. He's an aftercare king? That's not good for me. Do you need any more aftercare, sleepy? Sir, whatever you gotta give to me, give it to me. Huh. I want a hug. I want to drink water. I want to drink instead of water. I want to be left alone. I want an extra blanket. I want a hug. I think I deserve one. Silence follows. But surprisingly, Sirius complies and sets himself at the edge of the mattress. When I reach my arms out for him, he reciprocates. I find myself leaning in, resting my forehead on his shoulder, while his gloved hand rubs soothing circles across my back. The scent of cotton seems to come from him, a surprisingly gentle one, mingling with the incense and candle smoke that I've grown accustomed to. It's a strange feeling, being so physically close to someone you're not entirely sure you trust. But as we share bodily heat, and I feel the hard planes of his body against mine. I feel myself lowering my guard. Girl, let's not do this then. Eventually, our heartbeats match. All throughout our embrace, I never turn to look at him. I don't know what, what happened if I did. Mm. We stay like this for a while. Didn't think you were one for hugs. People need physical touch. It's essential for our well-being. I don't think there's any shame in indulging that. He sure loves his roundabout answers. After a few more seconds, I let go. Do you need anything else? I can pick them all. Alright, everybody, strap in for some aftercare. I want something more to drink. It's a little chilly here. I see. I'll go fetch you something. He's gone for a while again, allowing me even more time to wonder as to why he's being so kind. I can't forget his expression just a while ago. I don't think I ever will. When Sirius comes back with a mug of chamomile tea, I sit, I sip in silence. I usually take mine with honey. But this time, I'm grateful he's chosen not to add any. I don't think I'd be able to stomach it just yet. Could you imagine? I, I can see him in the kitchen being like making the tea and like shit. Probably not. <laughs> and just putting it, he's like. At least I feel it warm. Or at least I feel it warm me from the inside. And my muscles relax for the first time in a while. Better? Yeah. I want a blanket. I'm feeling very cold. That would make sense. The church is very isolated from the outside. He stands up and makes his way to a simple wooden dresser drawer and picks out a neatly folded blanket from the bottom drawer. Then, long fingers unfold it to reveal a beautifully patterned indigo colored quilt. He drapes it across my shoulder, surrounding me with warmth and a gentle, pillowy softness. Is this okay? He, his whisper makes me hesitant to answer. He's witnessing me at my most vulnerable, and I know that eventually it'll be much harder to keep my guard up. Yeah, this is good. Um, leave me alone. <laughs> That's all I need, just some space. He seems hesitant. All right. If I come back in half an hour, does that sound acceptable? 45 minutes. Very well. 
it's over it. The sound of the door shutting makes my shoulders slump slightly in relief. The mask comes off, as do my gloves and the rest of my cloak. It's the perfect opportunity to rest and regain my footing. My body still feels incredibly stiff, but with each stretch I feel it loosening and gradually becoming more responsive. When I realize I still have a bit of time, I close my eyes and meditate. A wave of calm settles over my mind, and with that, I know I made the right choice. That same calm persists even when he comes back. I'm all good now. Before I forget my star, I've got some news regarding the notes. This makes me sit up straighter in attention. Really? Indeed. I'll be sending out someone tomorrow, and if all goes well, they'll be back with positive news. Can't we just go there ourselves? Sirius seems apologetic. It's not a very safe place to be. I'd rather you stay here. You understand, right? Yes. I'm glad. Why... Why did that not quite feel right? Something at the back of my mind twists my words, distorting them as they leave my lips. I feel a cold sweat overtaking me even as Sirius hands help me out of bed. How long have you had your diagnoses for? Two months. Then you still have time. His hand brushes the wrinkles from my hood and stays there for a while. Yeah, I think so. I'll keep you safe. For the first time, I hear something akin to desperation in his voice, a barely audible tremble. I promise. This time, I chose to believe him. <gasps> Best end. Sirius will keep you safe. Okay, <laughs> so he kind of got me. Um, I, I, I just like him a little bit. Like I don't like him too much. I just, just a little bit. Um, so this was just the first video. I do have to go and get his other endings, but like I'm already, this is already like a three-hour recording. So I'm going to do another video and get all his endings and then I'm going to explore the other characters. So you'll be seeing a lot more of Obscura. I'm excited. I'm excited. This is the first game I think I've played on my channel that literally makes me like uncomfortable. <laughs> Not in a bad way like this game is uncomfortable, but like they set the atmosphere really well and I actually feel like I felt his imposing presence and I was nervous. <laughs> um, but as always, thank you so much for joining me. I love having you here. And I hope wherever you are, you are able to stay sleepy and cozy and have a great evening, morning, afternoon, night, whatever it may be. And I'll see you next time. <laughs>